All right. Now let's get into the Word of God. It's, it's December and we want to start preaching on Christmas. Hallelujah. Are you excited about Christmas? <laughs> Amen. Don't sound very excited. But it's good to be able to talk about why the Lord came. But this morning I'd like to go into the song that we sang just now. I do not know whether you know or not. It's taken directly out of the scripture. It's Mary's song. So we're going to go to Luke's gospel chapter 1 verses 46 through verse 50. I hope all of you have got Bibles. You may not have brought them with you, but I hope you've got Bibles. And uh, we will resume Bible studies once again in January. Now, I said we'll resume what? Bible studies. Bible studies. You know what? I discovered that nowhere in the Bible does it tell us to read the Bible. It always tells us to consume the Word of God, to make sure that the Word of God has a permanent place in our lives, to listen to the Word of God that we might be doers of the Word and not hearers. It talks about when we start to do that Word, then we are like people who build our houses on the rock and we shall never be shaken. But nowhere does it tell us to just read the Bible. God does not want us to just read the Bible. He wants us to understand that the Bible is the Word of God. It's life-transforming Word. And as we keep paying attention to it, not just reading it through and say, I read the Bible like I read a novel or I read the newspapers, but it is more than that. When we begin to study the Word of God, then something happens inside of us. Come on, amen. Our lives will start to be transformed. Paul writes to his young man called Timothy and he says, study to show yourself approved unto God, not read, but study to show yourself approved unto God. Amen? All right, so we're going to resume Bible studies, which is the most important part of our church. Actually, besides prayer, Bible studies are so important. We want to also say praise the Lord. Brother Noel Handroff is basically out of danger. Possibly would have been, you know, if those of you who know, we've been sending out prayer requests. And uh, he should be home by today or tomorrow, possibly. Uh, he was category four, but within the space of four or five days, the whole thing cleared up as you began to unite in prayer for him. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through verse 50, Mary said, or Mary sang the song. One translation says this. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the, the lowly state of his maidservants. Amen. And behold, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. And who is he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Isn't that what we're saying? And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. Mary sang this song. Another translation says, my soul is ecstatic overflowing with praises to the Lord, my spirit bursts with joy over my life-giving word. Let's just pray before we begin. Father, we thank you again for your precious word, and we invite the precious Holy Spirit to lead us into the scripture, open our understanding so that we can sing like Mary sang, a song of praise, a song of worship unto you, Lord, for you deserve all praise and all honor. I want to say thank you also for your miraculous working power in touching lives that need a touch from you. Once again, we bring our people before you and we say, if there's anyone, Lord, who has a need, that you will meet them so graciously, wonderfully, and powerfully that they may know that you are a prayer-answering God. For he who answers prayer is indeed God. So show yourself strong, stretch forth your mighty hand, touch lives that need to be touched, and we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Some years, many, many years ago, Pastor Lifan and me, we, uh, this is the early 1980s, uh, we went over to, in fact, the late, almost, uh, no, it was 1990s, went over to the United States. We went to Texas, basically, to preach in that church. And uh, 
on one of the mornings they had, we were going, I was going there to preach with the couple, Carl and Jackie Carruth, and they were taking us to the church. The name of the church is called Cathedral in the Pines. So it's a big, beautiful church, very big, very beautiful. They had a couple of thousand people. But we went early in the morning so, you know, we could just go for prayer. Walking on that huge, huge property, I think about 40 acres of land, and all pine trees, beautiful pine trees. So as we were walking, I heard this bird singing. And oh, it had such a beautiful, beautiful sound. And I said, you know, what bird is that? And Carl said to me, he says, actually, that, that song is not the song of the bird. The bird is called a mockingbird. And the mockingbird, what it does is it learns songs from all the different birds. So at one time it can be singing one song, and at another time it can be singing another song. And, but all the time, it does not have a song of its own. And you know, this morning I want to challenge us to have a song of our own. Psalm 96 verse 1, Passion Translation says this, Go ahead, sing your new song to the Lord. Let everyone in every language sing him a new song. Now, I want you to understand when we say something like that, God is not looking for you to have the ability of a songwriter. He's just looking for you to sing your song. In other words, number one, he wants there to be a song in your heart. He's not so interested in, in the vocabulary you use, but coming into an understanding of who he is. I'll talk about that in just a few moments. Mary had a whole new song, a song that we sang like mockingbirds. We picked up her song and we began to sing. I'd like to suggest a few things that I learned from this. One of the first things is I must learn to sing worshipfully. Sing worshipfully. My soul magnifies the Lord. I have heard a lot of people go for wonderful conferences in fantastic churches, big churches, and powerful conferences, or so I hear. And then when I come back, they talk, when they come back, I talk to them and they talk about, wow, next year, I must try to get a whole group to go. What was powerful about the conference? They were talked about the church was so big and so nice. They talk about the atmosphere in the church. They talk about the worship and the new songs that they learned. And, and you know, everybody was so, uh, like, so close, and it, it was a wonderful experience. We want to go back again. And very often, the church is magnified. The speakers are magnified. The worship team is magnified. But I seldom hear anyone speak about how the Lord was magnified in the service. And you begin to wonder, you know, is that why you spend all that money to go to have an experience, you know, just, just so that you could, you could have yours, you know, have this wonderful feeling of being in a crowd. And it's like being in a rock concert. And after that, it's all over. And you talk about the bands and you talk about all, everything else except the most important person. Christmas is about Jesus. Come on, amen. Thank God for nice decorations. Thank God for everything else. It's about Jesus and what he means to us. My soul magnifies the Lord. Let's not magnify the church or magnifies, you know, talk so much about everything else that's happening, but magnifies the Lord. If I leave a service without understanding that I have come to worship him, then I have missed out. When I come into the service, I will come to worship and glorify his name. Come on, amen. Psalm 95 verse 6 and 7 says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the sheep of his pasture. Come, let us worship, let us bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God. And we are the, it's like David is saying, the whole purpose is this. God is the one who created us. He is our maker. And we are but the sheep of his pasture. Therefore, 
it is absolutely imperative for me to understand that I must bow before Him and worship Him. Come on. He is worthy to be worshipped. The first thing Mary did was she sang worshipfully. When we enter, when our boss enters the room to talk to us, how do we speak to him? Do we sit down and stretch out in our chair? Do we put our hands in our pocket and talk to him? Like, or do we honor his position when we speak to him? Do we stand when he walks into the room? How do we respond to a person of authority in this world? How much more should we respond to God, our maker? That we cannot just sing songs and just enjoy the singing. And, you know, that's why I get, I get a bit, you know, upset when I hear people say, oh, today, uh, the worship not so good. Really? Was it for you? There's no such thing as not good worship. It's whether I had a good worship experience with God. Did I worship the Lord? So number two, the second thing is I must sing personally. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in Him. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. It doesn't matter whether it's in the mouth of other people, but I will worship the Lord. We have to learn that church. Every one of us must learn not just to have a worship experience in church. But I will. She didn't have a choir playing for her. She didn't have a band standing next to her and singing along with her. She sang to the Lord. My soul will magnify the Lord. Why did David become the man he did? Because when he was alone out there in the wilderness, he said, I will bless the Lord. I will worship him. He learned how to worship God and see the greatness of God so that when things began to happen that was bad, he was able to stand and say, I am serving God. Come on, amen. You guys may be the servants of Saul, but I'm a child of God. And he could come against the lion, come against the bear, come against Goliath. I mean, he could come against anything. How did this happen? When he learned the secret of meeting God personally. Come on, amen. I must learn to worship God. I must learn to praise him. I don't need a band to help me. Thank God we've got good musicians. We've got fantastic worship team to help us express ourselves before the Lord. But we need to understand when it is all over, worship continues. He is still God. Come on, amen. I will praise the Lord. I will bless, I will not, you know, say, well, this church is not a praising church and the people all don't worship. Like, that's nothing to do with me. I will bless him. Whether they worship or not. Whether they, you know, I grew up in a church, I told you before. I don't think my pastor is watching this. <laughs> but my pastor could not sing. But he would be leading in worship. My soul magnifies the Lord. My heart rejoices in God, my Savior, for He has done great things for me. That's how he sang. Seriously, that's how he sang. He could not carry a tune in a bucket. But you know what? We had a good worship, praying experience with God. Every individual in our church, we had a keyboardist that, you know, made the organ groan, <laughs> people moan, I mean, you know, but we began to re really sing, we sang, we didn't have a nice worship team, we didn't have a good band. Those days, if you played the drums, it was calling out demons from Africa. No such thing as electric guitar, it's alright to have acoustic, but no electric guitar. That's the rock world, that's bringing the world into the church. We didn't have all these things, but we worship God. Come on, amen. Individuals came in there with the purpose, I come to church to worship God, number one. Amen. Not just to be challenged by the word or encouraged by the word. I have come to worship God. It begins with worship. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. Secondary, then you shall do whatever you want to do. 
But first of all, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Can I hear an amen? Is this a Christmas message? Yes, it was the first Christmas song. So I sing worshipfully, I sing personally, I must sing intelligently. I must sing intelligently. My soul magnifies the Lord and the word is Yahweh, the great God, the mighty God. My spirit begins to uh, uh, burst out with joy and all of that. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Not only is he the great and mighty God, he is my Savior. Now, the thing is, do we know what we are singing? Gloria in excelsis Deo. What does that mean? Glory to God in the highest. Just Latin. We sing it in Latin because it's a nice song. Beautiful song, no doubt about it. But we need to understand that when I worship him, I need to know who I am worshiping. Many do not know who they worship. Maybe they say, I come to worship God. He is the Almighty One. He created me fine. Do you understand? Do we understand? Do I really understand when I say, God, my Savior? Do I know what it means to be saved? Having experienced the wonderful joy of His salvation. Do I know? Do I understand when I sing Amazing Grace? Does it touch my heart? Does it move me to compassion to say, God, I'm so grateful you picked me. I'm so grateful you did this for me. I'm so grateful you went to the cross for me. We need to know what we are doing. We need to sing intelligently. Can I hear an amen? It's sad when people don't even have a clue as to know what this Savior has done for us. Hallelujah. What he has done for me. And we need to understand that. Maybe we need to mature in our understanding of who he is. And the only way that can happen is when we spend a little bit more time with him. We are so involved with media. All kinds of stuff going on in the media. We are so caught up with the media. No wonder our thinking is governed by the world. It's of being governed by God. And no wonder fear enters our heart so easily because we are not governed by the Word and by God Himself. Come on. I need to sing intelligently. I need to grow in my knowledge of Him. Sing enthusiastically. My soul magnifies. My spirit rejoices. This morning I was just listening to uh, one of the theologians. He was talking about how, you know, the, the, when we were young Christians, I mean, if you came out of a denominational church, you understand that many of the denominational churches, they have the pew, then at the back of the pew, there is a place for you to kneel, to bow down and kneel and pray. So people come in, they will kneel. There is something about the expression of the body, getting involved. Now, of course, she doesn't talk about her body, but it is obvious that when her soul and her spirit is rejoicing, the body seeks expression. That's why we raise our hands at times. Without even realizing it, it becomes like second nature for us when it comes time to worship, to lift our hands and worship, to bow down before Him, to express ourselves. The hands will express themselves. Come on, amen. Very often I have to tell Pastor Lifan, you know, when she talks to me, she uses her hands a lot. She's more Italian. <laughs> Use her hands a lot when she speaks. Gets very excited when she starts talking. Don't you do that? When you start talking, your hands get involved, your body gets involved, your face begins to show it. And in our expression of worship to God, there must be more enthusiasm. Sometimes you, you know, of course you have heard this illustration of how people go into uh, you know, watch football matches and how they respond in football matches. <laughs> the cheers, the yell, the, you know, if you've been in a stadium, you understand this. And when I was in Kwantan, I used to go with a group of young guys to watch Kwantan, Pahang play, all right? And all oh, the excitement in the stadium is different from the excitement inside your living room. The excitement when you come together and, and, and allow 
a presence of God to encourage you and people beside you singing, it does something to you. We must learn to become more physical in our expression to God. Some because of physical uh, disabilities, in, in a certain sense, you cannot bow. Like I, I find it very difficult to kneel because I've got skinny knees. And it's painful to kneel for a long time. So those days we used to have, uh, Sister Christine will know, we used to have prayer cushions to put down and that we will kneel. When we come into prayer room, we will kneel, bow, kneel and pray. But there's something about kneeling before God. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord God, our maker. There's something about the expression of kneeling. It says, God, I, I am in complete awe of who you are and I bow my knee before you. I am nothing. You are everything. The idea of being uh, prostrate before the Lord, falling before him, uh, it, it shows our total honor of who he is and what we are. Amen. Sing enthusiastically. There is something powerful. Message translation puts it this way. I'm dancing the song of my God, my Savior God. I'm dancing the song of my Savior God. David was a great example of worshiping enthusiastically. He didn't care whether people watched him or not. He didn't care whether his wife criticized him or not. He just said, I'm going to dance before. I cannot contain the joy of seeing the presence of God come back into my city. I will rejoice. It is one thing to just say, you know, God, come into our presence. It's another thing to realize that he is coming into our homes. He has come and visited us. It's another thing to rejoice before him with all of our hearts, all of our souls. Come on, amen. Getting involved. That's why I say you've got to learn to sing above what you are thinking very often. Your thoughts will pull you down. Your heart will begin to say all kinds of things. Easy love for y'all to talk. Now, let me tell you something. Was it easy for her to talk? This was almost similar, in fact, worse than the time when Egypt, when Israel were slaves of Egypt. That's why he sent the deliverer. This time, the greatest deliverer of all. Why? Because during the time when the Israelites were in Egypt, they didn't know who God was. Moses had to come and tell them. Moses himself didn't know. Who am I? Who are you? What do I tell the people? Tell them I am who I am. They never knew this God. 400 over years as slaves, everything had gone. They didn't know this God. So to deliver them was something. But now in the time of Jesus, they knew God. They had scribes, they had Pharisees, they had all these people. They had the temple, they had everything. But they chose to ignore him, which is worse than not knowing him. Knowing him and, not, and ignoring him is different from just not knowing this person. Come on. God help us. So that though we know him, we don't ignore him. We say he's our savior. We got to understand. And so, so it was a totally different thing altogether. David said, I will praise the Lord, I will bless him, I will dance before the Lord. Clap your hands, all you people. Give unto God a, a shout of victory. It, it's going beyond this. It is saying, God, I know. And, and our thoughts sometimes will condemn us, but we say, God, I will still worship you. I will praise your name. I will clap my hands. Because if there's one thing that the enemy wants to steal besides your faith, it's your voice. So that you will not praise him anymore. Come on, amen. We must become praising people. There was a group of people that came to see, you know, they are from another church. They are considering buying our office block. So they're walking around. They said, how, uh, will there be any complaints, you know, when we begin to sing to the Lord? And I think they are more, I do not know what kind of group they were. I said, listen, we are Assembly of God people. We praise loud. When we had our building here, you know, when we were meeting in the shop lot, the building was filled up. We sang loud. Music was loud. Some people left because we were loud. Too loud. Like today. Drums too loud. <laughs> but it's all right. We worship God. We praise Him in spite of. I'm not going to lower the volume because, you know, you do not like it to be too loud. We raise the volume. 
There's the crowds in the heavens, thousands upon thousands, ten thousands upon ten thousand. And they are worshiping God. And their sound is like many thunderous waterfalls. And a voice comes out from the throne saying, Be quiet. You are too loud. No, it says, raise the volume. Praise Him even more for God is worthy to be praised. Something happens when you break yourself out physically. I will praise. I will worship. I will clap my hands. I will lift up my voice. It doesn't matter. And, and, and we often say this. God loves a joy. He says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I know sometimes our voices are noises. <laughs> we don't sing beautifully. But raise your voices for he is worthy. Number five, sing evangelistically. Sing evangelistically. In other words, we are, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. I want my song to be heard that God is my Savior. I want to sing that out. I want people to hear this song. There is a God who can save you. Not save you out of hell so that you can go to heaven. Save you. Create a way for you out of all the difficulties and troubles and problems. He wants to take you out of your prison and set you free. Save you from a life that's dull and boring and emptiness and give you something that is powerful. That's what he wants to save you from. A life of boredom. Come on. To a life of celebration. We often think, oh God is my savior. He wants to save me out of hell. God is not a fire escape man. He's more than that. He wants to deliver us. When he says deliverance, it means deliver out of all that the enemy has placed upon the earth. I always say this, God loves the world. The silver and the gold, the cattle on a thousand hills. God loves it all and wants it all to be redeemed. That's liberty. That's salvation. Come on, amen. That once again, we can hear dancing in the street and the virgin shall rejoice and clapping their hands. All these things is salvation. So we sing it confidently. You know what evangelism means? Evangelism means I, I do it in such a way that people will be so persuaded to embrace what I'm talking about. That's what evangelism is. Evangelism is not going out and, and, and you know, talk about hell and all of that and try to push people into the kingdom. Evangelism is sharing what you have. A good salesman will never talk bad about another product. He'll just talk about his own product. I have tasted it. It is good. It is wonderful. No wonder David said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's evangelism. Sing evangelistically. When I sing, I want people to look and say, hey Amen. That, that's the way you guys sing. You convince me. The way you worship Him. I know you. I know the trouble you are going through. But look at the way you are singing. Here is Mary, man. She's given one of the worst news anyone can have. So I want to go to the last point, which is sing confidently. She sings this. Listen. She begins to sing about God, my Savior. She is singing this song. She is singing it so confident. Why is she doing this? First thing she says is, He has regarded me. How can I sing confidently in spite of? Now remember, as I said, this is the worst time in Israel. And God comes with her. Listen, He has done great things for me. Seriously? What great things did He do for Mary? I mean, think about that song. Here's this girl, young virgin girl, who's about to get married, is given news that she's going to get pregnant. What great things. The great things is this. She sings, he has regard the fact that out of the millions of people, he decided me. He put his hand on my life. If he put his hand on my life, he definitely has got something good in store for me. I don't understand this. This seems to be bad news, but as far as I'm concerned, the moment he regarded me, the moment he put his finger on me, I know he's got something good in store. I just read the testimony of Timothy Keller, one of the great theologians, great writer, many books. He has written so many books. Great insp inspirational writer, 
powerful man of God, fourth stage of cancer. And he writes and he says, this is one thing I'm totally confident and is causing me to have tremendous strength. And that is the God that I serve loves me, in, you know, intensely. And he is so wise. I don't understand what I'm going through. But I do understand that because he has chosen me to do all these things in the past, write books, come to know him, preach in different conferences, definitely he's got a purpose in this. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. See, that's why a believer should sing confidently in spite of what they are going through. Come on, amen. Based on faith. If he has regarded me, he will have greater things in store for me. He has blessed me. And this blessing will overflow to all generations. They will look back and call me blessed. My testimony will reach generations to come. Of course, to the point where Mary is even worshipped today. But the point is this, until today, 2,000 years later, we're still talking about Mary. A girl who said yes to the Lord. But the thing about her was she could sing this so confidently. I don't know what's going to happen. See, she didn't see the tomorrow. She didn't see today. She only saw the condition that she was going to be. And she said, listen, I know God has got great things for me. He has already, as far as I'm concerned, he has already done great things for me. I don't see it yet. I don't see him, though I don't see him completely. I will trust him. I will believe in him that God has got great things in store for me. So we may go through some very, very tough times in life. But always understand that if you are a believer in God, then God has got greater things organized for you. Can I hear an amen? Greater things organized for you. So I sing confidently. Just like the birds, they sing so confidently, knowing that the sun will rise before the sun rises. They start singing their song, inviting the rising of the sun. They start singing first. We have, you know, some neighbors who rear some cockerels, about four or five of them, they're right? And early in the morning, they already, before the light comes up, they're already crowing. It's going to be a great day. It's going to be a wonderful day. All my wives <laughs> will find worms this morning. The sun will rise. I will sing and I will rejoice. Come on, amen. Some of them really make noise. They don't sing a song. But the fact is, confidently, they greet the morning. If the birds of the field of the air and the animals of the field can start greeting God, how much more you and me sing confidently in God who has sent his son. This is the thing that always captures my heart. If he has given me Jesus, doesn't matter what else comes my way, if he has given me Jesus, don't you think he really loves me and cares for me and he's got the best planned out for me? Can I hear an amen? Amen. Stand with me as we begin to serve you communion this morning.